Good Sunday morning. Welcome to our class and welcome whoever you are and from wherever you are watching the program. We are finding our roots in the past, our theological, doctrinal, spiritual roots to be able to understand how we got where we are today. I had mentioned before a class I took many years ago uh, on Reformation history. And that class did indeed change my life. For one thing, I was introduced to the teaching of Martin Luther. I'd heard of Martin Luther, but I really didn't understand what he understood about justification, justification by faith alone. And the more I studied that, the more glorious it became. But also in the context of that class that Dr. Kelly Sowards taught, I was introduced to the other Martin, and I had never heard of Martin Bucer. And as uh, the lectures continued on Bucer, I was increasingly fascinated and interested, and I began to recognize that he was of tremendous importance in the formation of the Reformation, what we now call uh, Reformed theology, the Reformed Church. I think uh, you will find his contributions to be important. And I even reached the conclusion that he is the father of Reformed theology. Now, you might say, well, that's not true. Of course, it was John Calvin, but understand that John Calvin was the protege of Martin Bucer. Martin Bucer was his mentor, that Calvin spent three years in Strasbourg studying and working with Martin Bucer. But I'll let you make that conclusion. Uh, I uh, actually decided to write a biography on Martin Bucer, which I did. And uh, in the course of preparing for that uh, book, I made a trip to Europe uh, and we visited as many of the Bucer sites as possible, where he preached, where he lived, where he conducted his uh, meetings and uh, found that extremely interesting. So I wanna share that with you to, today. Uh, indeed, hope you enjoy it. I hope you're blessed by it. I hope you benefit from it. And uh, I also certainly hope that what you are going to hear is the truth and that God will receive the glory. With that in mind, let's uh, find our roots today uh, with uh, Martin Bucer, the reformer of Strasbourg, 1491 to 1551. He is known as the fanatic for unity. That's one of, one of his friends called him that, the fanatic for unity. Now let's talk a little bit about his early life. Uh, he was born at Schlettstadt in Alsace in 1491. That today is in France. It was in Germany then. Today it's known as Schlettstadt, but it was a, a small town, but an important town. His parents were poor. They could not take care of him. That, uh, that was a serious problem. Uh, his father was a, a cooper, meaning he made barrels. And apparently there wasn't much work in Strasbourg at that time. So he, in, in Sestat, so he left and went to nearby Strasbourg and left young Martin in the care of his grandfather. Now his grandfather was an old fashioned German who did not appreciate academic studies. And Martin Bucer is very, very much like the other Martin whom we studied and even uh, Ulrich Zwingli, all of these gentlemen as young men were extremely intelligent and extremely interested in learning. Uh, and uh, Martin Bucer's grandfather just was not care about <laughs> helping his grandson in that regard. Uh, he wanted him to be a hard worker in uh, manual labor as, as his grandfather was. However, in Schlettstadt, in this small town in Alsace, there was an excellent humanistic school. Now that's quite unusual, a really good school. And when I say humanistic, I mean this is uh, in the line of Erasmus teaching, um, namely that the great problem with mankind is the lack of knowledge that can be corrected. And in the pursuit of knowledge, one goes to the text, especially the texts of the ancient world, the Greeks and the Romans, and by learning these great truths, 
Uh, one comes to understand better how to live and applying that in the Christian context, how to live the Christian life. So he went to this school, he attended this school. And after leaving the school in Schlesstadt, uh, in order to continue his studies, he joined a Dominican order. Uh, we've seen before how <clears throat> with Luther, for instance, uh, he went to the Augustinians. The monasteries at the time were the people who had the key to knowledge. Of course, the universities did also, but monasteries uh, were a wonderful opportunity for, for poorer people to have access to excellent libraries, and the Dominicans certainly had excellent libraries. So he joined the Dominican order uh, to further his studies, and like Luther, uh, his superiors in the monastery recognized his ability, and they also recognized that uh, they couldn't offer him everything, uh, as in the small town where he was. So they sent him to their chapter in Heidelberg in Germany, because there were better educational opportunities there. Uh, excellent library, and the Dominicans had access to that. They had their own library as well at Heidelberg. So he went to Heidelberg to further his humanistic education. Uh, now this is a picture of the very school. I, my wife and I had a chance to visit what is now known as Celestat, Schlettstadt, and very interesting that the school building is still there. This is the very building he attended. Today it is a museum dedicated to Busser, containing items of his. Uh, unfortunately, the day we were there, it was closed and we didn't get to see it. Uh, while he was there, another great humanist scholar, Jakob Gepweiler, was the headmaster of the school. And uh, we walked around the streets of Celestat and found this building. And on it, you see a picture of Beatus Renanus, as well as some writing. Uh, that, that mentioned that Beatus Renanus was a famous humanist scholar, one of the best in the world at that time. And he came to this small town of Schlettstadt and taught there. Now, I assume that this building was the very building that, uh, in which uh, Beatus Renanus lived while he was in Schlettstadt. But I, I was delighted to find that. And then uh, on the left, uh, here's a picture I took of the city as it exists today. And it impressed me that the buildings look very much like they could have been there uh, in the 16th century. Now the water tower on the right is not, I just found that to be a beautiful water tower and took a picture of it. Now, uh, while he's at the University of Heidelberg uh, in the Dominican order studying there, uh, he was converted by Martin Luther in a most interesting uh, incident that took place in 1518. He had to this point become an Erasmian scholar, uh, as we saw was the case with uh, Zwingli. These early reformers were taken up in, by the humanistic, Christian humanistic reform agenda, and thus with Martin Bucer. He was deeply committed to the humanist reform agenda. Now, what happened in 1518 was that Martin Luther was invited to come to Heidelberg. If you recall our study of Luther a few weeks ago, I mentioned that uh, 1518 was the same year in which he was called to defend his beliefs uh, in Augsburg before Cardinal Cajetan. But later in that year, he got an invitation to come to Heidelberg and defend what he believes. Now the uh, university refused to allow their lecture rooms for Luther to speak. But the Dominicans, and remember that Bucer is a Dominican, allowed their chapel to be used for this purpose. Now that seems a little strange that they would do that, but understand the Dominicans were e extremely committed to doctrinal truth and as they understood it, so they would naturally want to hear what, Bucer, what Luther had to say. Now, we don't know how many students from the University of Heidelberg were present at that lecture that Martin Luther delivered, but we do know that Martin Bucer was there and two of his friends, and we do know that these three people were deeply convicted and in fact were converted to the doctrines of the Reformation. 
particularly justification by faith alone. Now, there were 28 propositions that Luther presented. I'm not going to read all of them, but there are a few that I think are particularly interesting. So we can see how Bucer was affected by what Luther had to say. Here's his introduction. Distrusting completely our own wisdom, according to that counsel of the Holy Spirit, do not rely on your own insight. We humbly present to the judgment of all those who wish to be here, these theological paradoxes, so that it may become clear whether they have been deduced well or poorly from St. Paul, the especially chosen vessel and instrument of Christ, and also from St. Augustine, his most trustworthy interpreter. So he presents paradoxes, very interesting. The first one, the law of God, the most salutary doctrine of life, cannot advance man on his way to righteousness, but rather hinders him. Interesting, the law hinders. And the, the first several propositions can deal especially with the idea of works. And then he moves to free will. In Proposition 13, he says, free will after the fall <clears throat> exists in name only. And as long as it does what it is able to do, it commits a mortal sin. Free will after the fall has power to do good only in a passive capacity, but it can do evil <clears throat> in an evil capacity. Proposition 16. The person who believes that he can obtain grace by doing what is in him adds sin to sin so that he becomes doubly guilty. And if you remember, many of the scholastics, many of the scholars whom we've studied believe that if you do the best that you can do, that God will then give to you the habit of grace. That was the position of Thomas Aquinas. And Luther said, all you do is add sin to sin and become doubly guilty. Proposition 18, it is certain that man must utterly despair of his own ability before he is prepared to receive the grace of Christ. 21, and I should say Luther had this belief, this contrast in his mind of the theology of glory versus the theology of the cross. By theology of glory, he had in mind, of course, the Catholic uh, pomp and glory and uh, power of, of the clergy and ostentation. And the theology of the cross was the humble acceptance of Christ. So with that in mind, he says, a theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls the thing what it actually is. Proposition 25, he is not righteous who does much, but he who without work believes much in Christ. And then 26 was the proposition that particularly got Martin Booster's attention. The law says, do this, and it is never done. Grace says, believe in this, and everything is already done. Now, after the lecture, uh, you, you can just uh, see Martin Booser running up to Luther before he left uh, the lecture hall the, to ask him questions. And uh, Luther was willing to do that. As a matter of fact, Luther said, why don't you have lunch with me? Uh, and uh, I, I suppose in the dining hall of the Dominican order there. Uh, so Booser, Martin Booser, went to lunch with Martin Luther. And Luther said, let me show you my new commentary that I've just written on the book of Romans. And you can imagine how that might impress young Martin Bucer. And in Martin Bucer's own words, he said, I came an Erasmian, I left a Martinian. Now, eventually, he is going to become pastor of the largest church in Strasbourg, the big city in Alsace where his parents lived. But before that, he got married. He married Elizabeth Zilbergeisen. He was convinced that this doctrine within the Roman church of forced clerical celibacy produced nothing but immorality. 
he was certainly convinced that there was nothing in the Bible authorizing uh, such a practice. And he realized also that men and women have natural desires and to tell them that they cannot express those desires in the context of marriage simply drove them into a fornication, immorality, as we know many priests had mistresses. And so it was more than just believing that, uh, that people had the right to marry uh, in the sight of God. It was his belief that forbidding them to do so was the cause of gross immorality. So he was very much against this idea of clerical celibacy. And he had a good marriage with Elizabeth Zilbereisen. She did die in the plague uh, a few years later and several of his children did. But as soon as he got married, he found himself in trouble with the church because he had broken his vow, poverty, chastity, and obedience. He was now a married priest. He, he had actually taken the vows to be a priest. And uh, the only thing really that kept him from being taken to Rome and burned at the stake or some such thing as that were, were sympathetic nobles like Luther, uh, nobles who resented the power of the church and the authority of the church and uh, took him under their wing, so to speak. Uh, in this case, it was Franz von Sickingen, uh, who was uh, a nobleman in, in that area, in Valsas, and he looked after Luther until Franz von Sickingen died, and then he was in, had a problem. Uh, and the church excommunicated him. So to be excommunicated, a priest, excommunicated, a priest, Married, that's a problem. That's a serious problem. And he had no money. So uh, he fled to his parents. They had moved to Strasbourg. Remember, his father made uh, barrels. He had found work there. He had been relatively successful. So he went to Strasbourg to ask help from his parents. Now, what would Strasbourg do? Uh, the city council, of course, controlled Strasbourg. And uh, now they were being asked to allow a, a excommunicated married priest to live in their city. Uh, that would really be something that would be uh, illegal in, in normal circumstances. So the parents of Martin Booster actually went to the council, uh, had an appointment with the council and pled before the council for their son, begged the council to let Martin and his wife stay there. Uh, their argument was, we are citizens of Strasbourg. He is our son. He is a son, therefore, of citizens, and he should be protected. Now, one thing that might have worked in Martin Bucer's advantage to this point is that there were already reformed pastors there. That is, pastors who had come under Luther's influence and come to believe in justification by faith alone including Matthew Tsell. Uh, he was at St. Thomas at that time, and uh, he had a chance to preach at the cathedral. Now, the cathedral remained under the control. Uh, the canon of the cathedral was a, a Catholic, so the, the cathedral itself was never in the hands of Protestants. However, Matthew Tsell, was forbidden to preach at the cathedral, but he constructed a wooden pulpit, which he placed on the floor of the sanctuary of the cathedral. And because he wasn't occupying the official pulpit, he was able to preach there. And so when Martin Bucer came to Strasbourg and Matthew Tell realized he was reformed, uh, he said, I will share it with you. I will allow you to speak on this wooden pulpit in the cathedral on alternate days. And during the course of his early experience in Strasbourg, there was a congregation, a church, Saint Oriol. Uh, it was made up of poor gardeners and they didn't have a pastor. And they took a chance on young Martin Bucer and asked him, even though he was a, a married excommunicated priest, to be their pastor. And here is a picture uh, which we took of uh, Saint Oriol. This is Bucer's first parish in Strasbourg. He was called there in August of 1523. 
Now, Matthew Tell was getting older, uh, and the council was becoming increasingly supportive of the Reformation, and that meant of Martin Bucer, as well as the other pastors who agreed. Uh, the Reformation in Strasbourg actually came about incrementally, and it's hard to put a finger on the exact date that they approved the city for approved a reformation for the city, uh, I would say 1524. Uh, and between that 1524 and 1529, when the mass was officially abolished, uh, it was a gradual acceptance of the reformation in Strasbourg. Uh, because in 1529, the mass was abolished, it was complete. Now, it would seem that 1525 is the date <laughs> that Bucer was appointed the chief pastor at St. Thomas. And he was aided at St. Thomas by a capable staff of assistant pastors, most important, Wolfgang Capito. He had support from John Wickelampadius, who was the reformed pastor at Basel in Switzerland. This is a, a picture, portrait of uh, Matthew Zell. And this is the cathedral, which has an enormous steeple. I couldn't get it all in the picture, even though back down the street, uh, quite a distance. Uh, very impressive building. And this is where Bucer preached on the wooden platform that was built uh, for Matthew Tzell. And this is St. Thomas. This is the church where he became the senior pastor, one of the largest churches in Strasbourg. And it has a consistent record of being Protestant because uh, Stuttgart being in Germany originally uh, in the 16th and 17th century, rather, uh, King Louis the 16th, I'm sorry, King Louis the 14th uh, conquered a good part of this region. He conquered Alsace-Lorraine and Louis the 14th forced all of the areas where he had come become in power to convert back to Catholicism. He forced the mass, in other words, on all the area he conquered. However, whether it was out of respect for Bucer, whatever reason, he allowed St. Thomas to remain Protestant and it has remained Protestant to this day. Inside St. Thomas is this relief medallion of Bucer. I mentioned his staff, excellent staff of co-workers. And so the Reformation in Strasbourg became a model for other reformed communities. And specifically, it became a model for Calvin's Geneva. Now, Matthew Zell worked with Bucer and the others as long as he was living. Wolfgang Capito, I would say, was the main assistant pastor. There were two people named Sturm. They were not related. Both of them helped with the educational uh, program in Strasbourg. John Sturm was the head of the Strasbourg Academy and also there was Jakob Sturm, another very important pastor at St. Thomas working with uh, Martin Bucer was Kaspar Hadio and John Alasco, who was Polish and Paul Fagius. And of course he had cooperation from John Oekelampadius at Basel. And uh, he's not forgotten in Strasbourg today. Uh, there's a street name for him, as you see here, uh, with the French word Rue for street, Rue Martin Bucer. Now, what he did uh, was considerable. But I think one of the most important things that he did was to help organize the Marburg Colloquy. Now, I've spoken of this in regard to Luther and in regard to Zwingli. We're gonna to try to bring all that together now. The date was 1529. And the problem, this, the issue was the supper strife, das Abendmahlstreit. It was the division between Luther and Zwingli over the Lord's Supper. This is the most serious problem that was encountered within the Reformation. How to interpret the Lord's Supper. And Bucer desperately wanted the Protestants to remain united. This might be an influence from Erasmus. Erasmus said uh, at the time that Luther broke off from the Catholic Church, once this happens, 
then the church will continue to splinter and divide into various groups. Well, that has happened. And Bucer, uh, holding on to that, that uh, influence from Erasmus that emphasized unity, he wanted the Protestants to remain united. He had actually worked and continued to work throughout his life for reunification with the Roman church. He arranged several meetings with important uh, Catholic officials, cardinals of the Catholic church. And he thought with one of them, he'd actually convinced him. Uh, it, it didn't happen, but he never gave up hope that there could be a reunification, that the Roman church would allow the Protestants to maintain their doctrines, their practices, but under the, uh, uh, general rubric of the Catholic Church. And of course worked with Philip of Hesse, the nobleman, to arrange the discussion between the two at Marburg. Philip was uh, actually a Lutheran, he converted to the uh, Reformation, believing the doctrines. He was extremely important, he was extremely powerful, one of the major princes of Germany, and uh, he was until he was involved in a scandal. What happened was uh, he fell in love with another woman. He was married and he wanted to divorce his wife and marry this other woman. Uh, he talked to Booser and Booser said, no, you can't do that. You can't divorce your wife. Jesus taught against divorce. But of course, if you insist, uh, in the Old Testament, we find examples like David of men who had more than one wife. So he actually counseled bigamy, but he said, go ahead and marry her, but don't say anything about it. Let it be a well-kept secret. Well, Philip didn't do that. He had a big marriage ceremony. And of course, everybody knew about it. He was discredited. And that was unfortunate because uh, he was no longer to, able to be the powerful force in the Reformation that he had been. Now, let's go back to the issue. Both Luther and Zwingli rejected Catholic transubstantiation. They called it priestly magic. And they believed that the sacrifice of Christ was once and for all. But Luther believed in what he called the real presence or the doctrine of consubstantiation. That is that the elements, the bread and the wine were actually the real body and blood of Christ. And he said, look what Jesus said, this is my body and he meant it. The substance of the Lord's body is present. On the other hand, Swingley, enough of a humanist to dislike flesh and therefore physical interpretations, believed that the communion was only a symbol, a memorial. And he pointed to the words of Jesus, this do in remembrance of me. And as I said, Philip of Hesse was very concerned about unity because the Emperor Charles, who was a Habsburg and who was a devout Catholic, had just signed the Peace of Cambrai, 1529. He was at, in, in the midst of a long war that was in four stages with the King of France, Francis. And he had just signed a peace treaty. It didn't mean that the war was over, it, was, it, it gave a break. And so he turned his attention to the Lutherans and the princes in Germany uh, had this uh, uh, policy to which he had agreed at the first diet of Spire, that it, whatever their religion was would be the religion of the area that they ruled, the state they ruled. And uh, that's cuius regio aeus religio. But at this time, 1529, when he signed this piece of Cambrai, he reneged on it. And of course, the princes, the Lutheran princes in Germany protested, and then we get our word Protestant from that. And that led to the meeting at Augsburg and the presentation of the Augsburg Confession, which was approved. And also there was Zwingli. Uh, Charles would have an opportunity now to deal with Zwingli, as would the Pope and the Catholic Church, because the area north of Zurich, where Zwingli preached, was Catholic. It had been Protestant, but during the Peasants' Revolt, the people there, who were very hurt by Luther's denouncing them for their violence, went back to the Catholic Church. And the area to the south of Zwingli, the three Catholic cantons of Schweiz, Uri, and Unterwald had remained Catholic and were passionately so. So Zwingli was sandwiched between Catholics. And so he was in a very precarious situation. 
Now, Busser was also working for unity, but he was more concerned about the spiritual unity among the Protestants to maintain a single Protestant church. And so uh, they worked, uh, Philip of Hesse, Martin Busser, and Philip Melanchthon, Luther's assistant, arranged for the two to meet at Philip's castle at Marburg in October of 1529. Well, the meeting was a failure because Luther was intransigent, he would not yield. Here's a picture of the castle as it appears today, much the same as it was in 1529. Had a chance to go there and uh, most fascinating. Now, during the meeting, I think right before, as best I could determine, um, which it was a failure during the meeting, but right before, evidently Busser and Luther were talking. Some people say Zwingli and Luther were talking, but it seems it was Busser and Luther. And Luther turned to Busser. And he had supported Busser before. Of course, they'd been good friends. We saw that from the uh, meeting they had at Heidelberg. And he turns to Busser and says, you have a different spirit. And it was obvious to Busser at that point that Luther was not going to give in. But Busser continued to work on a formula on which both leaders could agree. And that formula had great importance for the Reformed Church. Uh, he drew up the uh, kind of a, a confession of faith, but particularly focusing on the Lord's Supper called the Wittenberg Concord. And Luther for a while agreed to that. Busser had gone to Wittenberg to meet with Luther. At first, Luther would not even talk to him. And then Busser continually pled with him to meet and they did meet. And Luther broke down in tears and said, I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I'm wrong. I have wronged you, Busser, and I love you dearly. And it appeared he was going to accept the conclusions, but then he backed away from it. Busser tried again with the Tetrapolitan Confession. This was to be a confession for all Protestant churches. Uh, it wound up only four cities signed it, hence it's called Tetrapolitan. Now, this is the room in which the discussion took place at Marburg. Uh, the actual room, as you can see, it's used for meetings today. There are chairs and there are lights. They were setting up <clears throat> for some type of a meeting when I was there. But on the wall, which would be to the right of where this picture is taken, is a picture that shows the meeting. And if you look at the painting, you can see that it indeed took place in that room. Now, this is a very important meeting because 18 of the Protestant leaders were there. 18 leaders of the early Reformation had come to this meeting to try to work out differences between uh, Zwingli and Luther over the Lord's Supper. Now to the far left, you see Philip of Hesse in his uh, noble attire. Uh, on the far right, you see Zwingli with his uh, finger making a point uh, uh, to Luther, trying to talk to him, uh, trying to convince him that the, the communion is not the literal body and blood of Christ. And Luther, you see him there uh, standing next to Zwingli, uh, took a piece of chalk and he wrote on the tablecloth, you see that, he wrote on the tablecloth in chalk, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. And he wouldn't say anything. He just kept pointing, as you see there in the painting. He kept pointing to what he had written. Now, at the head of the table, you see Martin Busser. He's turned to look at Philip Melanchthon. These are the two who planned the meeting. Now, Busser kept communicating with Luther and Zwingli and telling both of them, you both are saying the same things in different ways. Now, whether that was true or not, we do not know, but that was what Luther, Luther was saying to them. But as he was working over a course of several years on this problem, trying to find a way that he could bring them together, he produced a midway synthesis. And this is so important because this synthesis that he produced is the doctrine which is accepted by Reformed churches throughout the world today. First of all, the elements are not the literal body and blood of Christ. He tried to get Luther to admit that. Jesus' body is in heaven, we know that. But, and here's where he moved closer to Luther than to Zwingli, 
it is the body and blood of Christ, not literal, but spiritually. It's taken, the body and blood of Christ is taken under the form of bread and wine. And Christ is present with us in the Lord's Supper. Now, because Calvin often traveled with him and communicated with him, and they were very close, Calvin being younger, and Bucer was his mentor. Uh, he convinced Calvin of this doctrine. Therefore, wherever Calvin's influence spread, this interpretation of the Lord's Supper went also. And when he went to England, he convinced Thomas Cranmer of this doctrine. So it became incorporated into Reformed and Anglican theology. And here are Bucer's words on the subject. In this sacrament, his true body and true blood are truly given to eat and drink as food for their souls and to eternal life that they re may remain in him and he in them. It is the true body and blood of Christ taken under the form of bread and wine. <clears throat> now, he continued to work for unity among Christians. And another accomplishment of Martin Bucer uh, in, in this category, working for unity, was the doctrine of essentials. As he defined his platform of unity, he suggested that theologians should go to the Bible and determine what was essential for all Christians to believe and practice. What is essential? Now, the things that were not essential, these doctrines, these practices, would be matters of faith over which we would not divide. So a difference between the essentials and the non-essentials. These non-essentials, which he called adiaphora, would be areas where different interpretations would be respected and over which there'd be no division. The church could thus stay together if they would stay with what was essential and that they would all believe and practice and let the other things be up to individuals and individual churches. Now, Strasbourg generally was very tolerant. They had an open policy. Refugees who were hunted down in other areas by Catholics and by Protestants were allowed a safe uh, refuge in Strasbourg. And of course, the Anabaptists were the most persecuted of uh, groups. We've studied them. They came to Strasbourg and the policy of the city council, you can stay here unless you cause trouble. Well, unfortunately, they did cause trouble. Uh, they caused disturbances. Uh, and as a result, they were in prison. But uh, remember, Bucer is working tirelessly to communicate and reunite with Catholics and with Protestants. He wants to keep them together. And that meant you try to work with the Anabaptists also. And so he had uh, actually gone to the prison in Strasbourg and met with Hans Denk, the leader of these Anabaptists, to try to uh, persuade them to... Uh, behave themselves so that the church could remain together. Now, Bucer was the great diplomat of Protestants. He was intrepid. He had no inhibitions. And uh, he had worked with Philip Melanchthon and the Lutheran princes be to present the emperor with the Augsburg Confession. Recall that Luther could not go to Augsburg. And so the, the confession was actually composed by Philip Melanchthon, but Martin Bucer tried to get all the Protestants to sign it. So this will be our confession. It will hold us together. However, Zwingli was reluctant to do so. Zwingli was still alive in 1530. He was killed at, uh, uh, in 1531. And uh, Heinrich Bullinger succeeded him. Both Zwingli and Bullinger were reluctant to sign the Augsburg Confession. So it never became the confession for all Protestants. It became the confession of the Lutheran Church, leaving Bucer to continue his efforts to find that confession that everybody would agree on. He composed many confessions and statements of faith. And I will say he was rather wordy uh, in what he did. Uh, Calvin um, criticized him for his uh, verbose manner of, of writing. Bucer also was a great diplomat. He sent representatives to the court of King Francis of France to try to persuade him. He had absolutely no inhibitions about doing that. And he also attempted to reach Henry VIII, 
and sent representatives to England. He wanted these kings to understand and to believe in the doctrines of the Reformation. And of course, as I said, he negotiated with Catholic cardinals and coming very close to having success with them. He tried to work with the Catholic Emperor, Habsburg Emperor Charles V, and of course worked very closely with Philip of Hesse until Philip's scandal arose. And he scheduled these religious discussions continually. And as I mentioned earlier, many times he took young John Calvin with him. Uh, these debates, these colloquies, these meetings the, at Regensburg with the Catholics there, Wittenberg with Luther, Augsburg before the, uh, the emperor and the German princes, Cologne, Marburg, of course, the colloquy there, Arms, other places. And he wrote continually to answer critics. Every time someone asked him a question, every time he found something uh, published, written that he thought was wrong, he's going to write an answer to it. Uh, he was completely dedicated to his work. He spent his last years in exile in England because of the interim. The interim was imposed by the Emperor Charles and it meant the mass would be restored in Strasbourg and other places, uh, and it restricted Protestants. Now, why did Charles act? Well, of course, there was the fact that he had time to do that uh, at various points along the way, but the particular thing that really tipped it off was Busser's work with Hermann von Wied. He was the Archbishop of Kuhn, and he was one of the seven electors, and Busser converted him to the belief of the Reformation. And the emperor said, that's it. I can't have one of the electors. Remember the electors were like the board of directors uh, and uh, I can't afford to have one of them be a Protestant. And that's when he imposed the interim. Now, did the city council support Booster? They could have stood between Booster and the emperor, but they didn't. And what had happened was that through the years, the original city council, which had been very supportive of Booser, had been replaced by new members of the council. And these new members were not supportive. And so that left Booser in a situation where there was no choice but to leave Strasbourg. And so he and Paul Foggius were sent into exile. But Thomas Cranmer had urged them to come to England and help him. Thomas Cranmer was in the process of trying to set up a reformed community in England uh, after the death of King Henry VIII. Now, Booser was sick, he was discouraged, he was tired, yet he went to England and he worked very, very hard, very assiduously to try to help uh, Cranmer there. Uh, so he influenced not only John Calvin, but Thomas Cranmer uh, in the English Reformation. While he was there, Booser taught at Cambridge. Erasmus had taught there earlier. Uh, he helped Cranmer write the Book of Common Prayer, which is the liturgical book of the Anglicans. And he himself alone composed the English ordinal. And he encouraged Cranmer on various doctrines. On the doctrine of predestination, he, he needed uh, uh, the definition of that doctrine. He didn't understand the doctrine of predestination. And Booser taught him that. On justification, he also needed refinement and clarification. On forensic justification, he taught him that. And of course, the communion, as by this time, Busser had defined the doctrine of the spiritual presence, and he taught that to Cranmer, and understand, therefore, that the official doctrine in the Anglican Church, Episcopal Church, is the doctrine of the spiritual presence. It is not consubstantiation. And at this time, the king, after the death of Henry VIII, was the son of Henry VIII, King Edward VI, a young man, a boy, a teenager. He was very intelligent, but unfortunately he was very sickly and he died after just a few years. But while he was king, Busser wrote his, perhaps his greatest work, De Regno Christi, on the kingdom of Christ to King Edward VI, with the intention of giving him a blueprint, a pattern for a true Christian community, which he hoped the king could set up. Unfortunately, uh, Busser is going to die <coughs> within a short time. And then two years after Busser's death, 
Edward himself died and was succeeded by Mary. Well, he was never well after he went to England uh, and uh, died in 1551 after only two years of being there. Now, I mentioned earlier that Elizabeth, his first wife, had died a victim of the plague and many of his children, he had a large, great number of children, but unfortunately he spent so much of his time away from them uh, that he really couldn't be a, a good husband and father, but his wife loved him and was very faithful to him. But on her deathbed, Elizabeth Zilbergeisen Busser uh, asked her friend, Vivandus Rosenblatt, to marry her husband. Now, Vivandus Rosenblatt was the widow already of two reformed pastors. She was the widow of Wolfgang Capito, who had died. She was the widow of John Oikilampadius, who had died. So actually, uh, she does marry Busser, and she becomes a widow of three reformed pastors. She was with him when he died. He was buried at Cambridge, and later when Mary, Bloody Mary, uh, came to the throne uh, in 1553, she had his bones exhumed and disgraced. However, 1558, when Elizabeth became the queen, she restored Busser to honor and had a ceremony to do so. And interestingly enough, the same rector of Cambridge presided over both ceremonies, the ceremony of desecration and the ceremony of re-consecration of Martin Busser's remains. Now, Busser, like all of these pastors, we'll see that being a pastor as the main function that they had in spite of all the other work that they did. It was great work of traveling, debating, writing, meeting, setting up uh, sessions. But the main thing for all of them was, as you see here, the true care of souls. That was Booser's first publication, the true care of souls. And uh, there are some examples here of, of pastoral things he accomplished. For instance, at Strasbourg, he set up in the church there, <clears throat> in the community there, the first small groups. These small groups were voluntary uh, associations. Um, uh, we would say uh, Bible studies. Um, and they would commit to uh, living the Christian life and trying to do everything they could <clears throat> to encourage others to live committed Christian lives. Also, he is responsible <clears throat> for the first Protestant confirmation. That is, when a, a young person reached an age of belief, they would make a public profession of that belief. And that practice has been followed. And this is interesting. <clears throat> he is the one who returned the office of elder to the churches. In the early church, there were elders, but very soon that office morphed into priest, in the office of priest, and disappeared. And neither Luther nor Zwingli had restored it. Busser restored that office to the church. Of course, it was picked up by Calvin, and thus we find in Reformed churches, the office of elder. Of course, he, as we have seen, defined the doctrine of the presence, spiritual presence, for the Lord's Supper. He had a very definite program of church discipline, which was practiced by Calvin in Geneva. He had a definite educational program at the Strasbourg Academy that today is the University of Strasbourg. That also was carried on by Calvin in Geneva with the Academy at Geneva. Uh, he developed a reformed liturgy. And we'll look at that in a moment. He held conferences continually in pursuit of unity. And also, congregational singing was first officially recognized in Strasbourg. <clears throat> Even though Luther had it in Wittenberg, uh, it was official for the church uh, in Strasbourg. So these are firsts that uh, Luther contributed. And here's the uh, liturgy. <clears throat> this comes from 1537. And just notice how very similar it sounds to liturgies that we have today. It began with a confession of sin. And then there were words of pardon, 
assurance of pardon, if you please. <clears throat> there was a, a statement of forgiveness, absolution. And then they sang a hymn. There would be a prayer for illumination. The gospel text would be read. The sermon would be presented based on that text. There would then be the collection of alms, God's tithe, our offerings. <clears throat> there would be a creed recited. There would be a prayer of intercession and consecration, followed by the Lord's Prayer, followed by the Lord's Supper weekly, observe. Uh, the one presiding would give the words of exhortation, followed by the words of institution. It would be the breaking of the bread, uh, the taking of the bread and the cup, a psalm or hymn, a prayer of thanksgiving and dismissal by the ironic benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you. <clears throat> now, if we go back to the paths we trace in the seven um, areas of, that we're following, you're going to find agreement um, among Martin Luther, uh, Ulrich Zwingli, and Martin Bucer on five out of the seven. If we ask <clears throat> who is Christ, they would all agree, Son of God. What must one do to be saved? They would all agree. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. <clears throat> if you ask them, what is the true church? They would all agree, it is the invisible church of the elect. On the fourth, what are the sacraments and worship? There would be disagreement, of course. On the sacraments, three different viewpoints. Luther, uh, it is the literal body and blood of Christ. Zwingli, it is a symbol. Bucer, it is uh, the spiritual presence of the Lord. How should the Christian live? They all agree. Who is God? They all agree. And then on the seventh, there would be some disagreement because Luther's belief was we can do anything that's not forbidden. Zwingli's belief was we can do only that which the Bible allows. Bucer's belief was the doctrine of essentials. Let's study the Bible, find out what is essential, do that, and let the other things be matters of opinion over which we do not divide. So next week, we will turn to the study of John Calvin, the reformer of Geneva, the student, uh, the protege of Martin Bucer, and see how he implemented the reforms of uh, Bucer in Geneva. Thank you for joining us on this journey back to Strasbourg. Hope you found it interesting. I uh, am fascinated by Martin Bucer, but of course he's just one of the great reform leaders, reformation leaders that God raised up uh, to return his church to where it uh, started out to be as we follow these paths uh, of where we came from, where we are today, and I think where we should be. I hope for all of you a blessed week that uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you all.